Hey friends, Melvin here. Probably one of the most requested Bible passages that you've asked me to make a video about is the story that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus. Was this an actual real event that Jesus talked about? Does this teach that there are people being tormented in hell right now and will be forever? We'll find the answers to these questions and even if you don't know the story, don't worry, I'll catch you up. I know that sometimes it can be hard to understand the Bible, right? And even the explanations that you might listen to can often be long or confusing or just wrong. But on this channel, I like to keep things short and simple so that things make sense to you. So if you want to get to know the Bible better for yourself, then make sure to click the bell icon that comes up after subscribing so you don't miss the videos that you would actually like to see. All right, let's read what Jesus said and then we'll break it down. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fix, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now before you take some parts of this story and draw all kinds of conclusions, wait, okay? Just like with everything, let's first establish the context so we don't draw the wrong conclusions. If we jump back a little bit before Jesus started this story, the Bible gives us some very important insights that help us understand why Jesus even told the story and who he told it to. It says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things. And I'll tell you soon what all these things refer to. And they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Okay. Keep in mind what I'm about to say. This will be like the key that later will unlock this whole story for you, all right? So Jesus is talking to a group of religious leaders, the Pharisees, the lovers of money who were thinking very highly of themselves and appear like godly people before everyone else. But God saw their hearts and he knew this isn't good. That is the context that triggered Jesus to tell the story of the rich man and Lazarus, all right? Keep that in mind. We'll get back to that. So we just read that these Pharisees heard all these things. What things? Again, flipping back a page, establishing the context, we see that Jesus has been on a roll of telling a series of parables. And parables are stories that Jesus makes up to communicate a deeper truth or certain principles. And the two parables that Jesus has just told them, one known as the prodigal son and one as the unjust steward, guess how they start? The first, a certain man. And the other parable, there was a certain rich man. Hmm, how did Jesus start the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Do you remember? There was a certain rich man. The exact same way. In other words, the story of the rich man and Lazarus is also a parable. Jesus just continued this series. And this is crucial to understand because this means we cannot take everything in the story literally. That's very dangerous. Just like with all the other parables, you should look for what is the underlying point that Jesus is trying to make come across and not get distracted by the props on the set. This isn't meant for us to base doctrine on. 
And it's not only the way that Jesus starts the story that makes it clear that we're talking about parable here, but when you continue to read the story as he just did, you see this figurative language and ideas all throughout the story, confirming that yes, this really is a parable. Just to mention a few examples, number one, there is no way that all the safe people fit into Abraham's bosom. No amount of working out can grow such a big chest that this would fit. This is obviously figurative language. And number two, if hell would be on or in the earth and heaven way up there in space, there's no way that they can see each other, let alone talk to each other. That too is clearly figuratively and we can be very happy about that because heaven would be a pretty messed up place if throughout all eternity we would be able to see our former loved ones being tormented and hear them crying out to us. Ugh. Just the thought of that, I'm happy that's not the case. And I know that there are some people who claim that there are some sort of temporary in-between place called paradise before going to heaven, but this is not biblical at all. It's actually something that the Catholic Church came up with during the time of the Dark Ages in order to gain more power and control over the people, but that's a video for another time. Number three, as you may know, my wife has a pretty severe skin condition and when that flares up, she is suffering intensely and guess what? The pain that she experiences makes her completely unable to focus. She cannot express herself. She often cannot even say any words, she just makes sounds when she, when she is in that much pain. If this rich man would really be tormented in the fire, there's no way he could have such an intelligent conversation like the one that he's having in the parable. That's just not how it works. Number four, suffering in this blazing fire, do you think that a drop of water would make the slightest difference in his suffering? That drop of water, if anything, would be long evaporated before it would even reach his tongue. Number five, I guess you get the point by now, but just a final note on this. Jesus himself taught that when you die, you're asleep all the way until the end of time. When Jesus comes again and resurrects his people from the dead, he's been very clear on this. So for the dead to be in heaven or hell and even being able to communicate and reason, that's not what the Bible teaches. So why then did Jesus tell this story with all these elements that either don't make sense or are even against what the Bible teaches? This is where that key will unlock the story. Remember, who was he primarily talking to? The religious leaders, right? They were the lovers of money. They were the ones appearing to be blessed by God. They were the ones that everyone else was looking up to. They were highly esteemed. They are represented by the rich man. And they were the same ones who were not sharing these riches of the message of the gospel with the Gentiles, with those in need of it, with those begging for it. Instead, they treated the Gentiles as their enemies. And when you're poor and sick, oh, you, you must be punished by God. <laughs> you know? And these were the people that they despised most, and they were represented by Lazarus. Also being influenced by, for example, the Greek religions, the Pharisees believed in the immortality of the soul and that when you die, angels carry you to Abraham's bosom, or if you're a Gentile, a non-Jew, of course, you go to Hades, hell, right? And it can seem a bit weird to us, like why, why Abraham, why Abraham's bosom? Well, we see many times throughout the scripture that the Jews saw Abraham as their way to salvation because they are from Abrahamic descent. They're pretty much guaranteed salvation. That's how they thought. That's why this rich man approaches Abraham in a way that normally you would only approach God. Instead of believing in Jesus for their salvation, they clung to this idea that we of our father Abraham, as if somehow then they would be favored. And Jesus with this story is then meeting his audience where they are. This parable isn't meant for us to base doctrine on about hell or what happens after you die. No, he simply took concepts and beliefs that were well known to his audience, as he did with most of his parables, and he used it in a way to communicate a deeper truth or lesson. He wasn't affirming these ideas. These are just the parts of the parable that are like the props on the set. They just help his audience to get the picture and to find themselves in it. But then Jesus took that and completely flipped it upside down because contrary to what they believed and what they taught is what Jesus said. Like, hey, you got it mixed up. The rich man is not the one favored by God. He's not the one going to Abraham's bosom, a reference to them being saved. It's actually the one that you thought is the one who's cursed. 
the one undeserving, the one punished by God, the one who you were called to serve and share with them the knowledge about God that you have. This is the underlying lesson that Jesus wanted to teach them. It's the same point that Jesus made in the parable right before this one. What you do in this life, the person who you choose to be will determine your future destiny. It's not by riches, it's not lineage, it's not church attendance or what clothes you wear, it's not your reputation, it's not your intellect, it's are you faithful with what God has given you? Are you faithful with the people that he has surrounded you with? Are you faithful with the resources that he has given you? Are you faithful in sharing with others the hope that he has given you? Is your heart in the right place? Remember, God sees the heart. And to extra emphasize this point, Jesus even put like this punchline in this parable, because this is the only parable in which Jesus gives one of the characters a name, Lazarus. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. Not long after Jesus told this parable, a man died. And for four days, this certain man was laying dead in the tomb. And when Jesus came there, he resurrected this man from the dead. Make a wild guess. What was the name of this man? Lazarus. And did the Pharisees take this incredible miracle as that divine sign that Jesus is their way to salvation? That Jesus is the Son of God? Were they convinced, repented from their evil ways and beginning to follow Jesus? It's hard to believe their reaction. So I want you to see it from the Bible so you know that I'm not making this stuff up. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. That's when you say, case in point. It's all about the heart. No matter what you claim with your words, no matter your appearance, no matter what miracles and signs you get, if your heart is not in the right place, it does nothing for you. While at the same time, it gives incredible hope to the people represented by Lazarus. That no matter your conditions, no matter if you're poor or unlearned or sick, you don't have it all together, if your heart is in the right place and you long for truth and doing good, then Jesus has a bright future for you. And if you want to know more about that future, you're going to get so excited about this next video. It'll pop on here in a second. I'll see you there. Maranatha.